Welcome to the fourth module of EdCap's e-learning series on public-private partnerships or PPPs. In this module, we will discuss a critical element of PPP project, the risk allocation. What are the risks to consider and how are these risks best allocated among partners? Risk allocation is important because it's a critical factor to the success of PPP project. If all the risks is shifted to the private partner, the project will be deemed too risky and there will be no interest from the private partner nor any banks prepared to finance it. On the other hand, if all the risks remain in the public partner, then there will be a limited incentive for the private partner to innovate and perform efficiently. In this case, using the PPP mechanism might not offer any added value compared to traditional procurement. So finding the right balance of risk allocation will be critical to the success of PPP project. To find this balance, we often say that the risk should be allocated to the party best equipped to manage it. This means the partner that can best control the risk or reduce the impact of that risk on the project. To see how this principle can be applied in practice, we will review the key risks of PPP projects. Starting with the supply side, the question is, what are the risk factors that could prevent the public service from being delivered? Land availability is of critical importance. Without land, no infrastructure project can be realized. Land may not be available or easy to acquire for a number of reasons. Sometimes land may be unsuitable or require restoration from contamination. Historical site requiring preservation may be discovered, create project delays. Further delay may occur due to the need for environmental permits or due to population resettlement requirements. Normally, the public partner is in the best position to handle the risks of land acquisition, as legal procedures are usually required. Whenever possible, it is recommended that land is secure before the commencement of the tendering process due to the potential impact of land acquisition factors on project delivery. Another type of risk is associated with infrastructure construction. Cost overrun and delays can occur during construction phase. Infrastructure might not be constructed well or might not deliver the service required. In a PPP contract, construction risk is allocated to private partner. Is this a significant risk? Study based on review of a large pool of cross-country infrastructure projects have shown that approximately 86% of public infrastructure projects exceed their initial budgets by a considerable margin, 28% on average. Comparison between traditional procurement and PPPs have also demonstrated that project implemented PPPs are less likely to exceed their initial budget than those following traditional procurement. PPP projects additionally present stronger incentive to deliver projects on time, as the private sector is not renumerated until construction is complete. After the construction phase, operational risks may need to be considered. Operating or maintaining an asset might be more expensive than planned. For example, salaries or input prices might be higher than anticipated, correspondingly increasing overall operating costs. Service interruption may result in considerable revenue losses. These risks are also allocated to private partner in a PPP project and can be mitigated by having tariff automatically adjusted to inflation and through long-term input supply contracts. Another risk occurs at the end of the contract when the asset is handed back to the public. At the time, the risk is that the asset may be in considerably poorer condition than anticipated, and extensive upgrade costs may be incurred. This risk is borne by the public authorities if they decided to operate the asset once the contract is terminated. Linking a final payment to the condition of the asset can incentivize the private partner to ensure that the asset remains in good condition until the end of partnership. The contract can also stipulate required standards and the asset must meet at the time of transfer. Now that we have covered supply side risks, we can have a look at demand risk. The risk here is that a number of users of a public asset may be lower than anticipated, resulting in lower revenues and financial distress. Unfortunately, forecasting demand over a long period can be particularly difficult. A number of factors can influence the demand for public services, such as economic and demographic trends. Competing services can also reduce the anticipated demand. For example, the opening of a new airport in a nearby region might impact demand for air transport locally. 
Errors may occur through an overestimation of the willingness to pay of users. Some users may decide not to use a toll highway, even if it is faster option, simply because they may view the cost as unjustified by the time saved. There are additional risks associated with access to infrastructure that are not under the control of the concessionaire. For example, a port depends on the quality of the road connecting it to the hinterland, which is not something a port operator can control. Such difficulties have contributed to inaccurate forecasting in the past, which can be overly optimistic on average. Inaccurate forecasts can make the allocation of risks particularly difficult. Shifting the risk to the private partner can incentivize it to provide high quality service to attract as many users as possible. But if the private partner has little influence on the demand for services and forecasts are largely unreliable, then it may not make sense to transfer the risks as the premium charged by private sector may be too high. Risk channeling is also a possibility. For example, public guarantee can be provided to ensure minimum revenue stream to private partner independently of the number of users. An extension of the concession period can be granted to compensate for lower demand. Or exclusivity right can be provided to ensure that no competing infrastructure project will be developed during a certain period of time. Now that we have covered the commercial risks on both the supply and demand side, let's review the financial risks faced by PPP projects. The first financial risk concerns whether funds will be available once a project is awarded to a preferred bidder. Before an award, the bank may not be in a position to provide a detailed review of the project document in order to make a final decision, and there's a risk that the bank might review financing following their due diligence. This is a shared risk as both parties have invested considerable time and money by this stage of development. Involving the banks in the process early can reduce this risk by allowing banks to provide timely indication of their readiness to lend money for the project. The public authority can also request to have financial commitments from the bank, including in the bidding documents. However, this may increase transaction costs and bank's commitment will likely to subject to conditions. The public authority might also decide to set maximum period for reaching financial close, beyond which it has the right to reaward the project to another bidder. Another financial risk that has caused many projects to fall in developing countries concerning cu currency mismatch. Such risk exists when there is a disparity between project revenue, usually in local currency, and the currency of the loans contracted to finance it. In this case, project revenue must be converted prior to each loan installment. If the local currency is devaluated during the life of the project revenue, may not be sufficient to cover loan repayments. The easiest solution is to borrow in local currency, and the private partner should bear the risks if loans are available in local currency. If local currency loans are not available in public authority, may need to support these risks, as the private partner may not be prepared to accept a risk over which it has no control. The third financial risk, which is also a political one, is related to the repatriation and convertibility of revenues. As investors might not be located in the country where revenues are generated, money will need to be transferred abroad. However, a country might decide to impose capital control measures, for instance, in the case of a major currency crisis, thereby reducing the ability to make transfers. In emerging markets, the private sector will try to obtain some protection against these risks. Another set of risks that merit consideration relate to adverse chain in the legal framework, or policy decision that can negatively impact the value of a project. Having no control over these risks, the private sector will seek measures of protection and compensation for them. If such risk is perceived as too high, then there will be no interest from the private sector. Let's take the example of a private company building a school in exchange for regular payments from the government, provided such performance standards are met. The political leak is that the government may decide to terminate the contract or even expropriate the private company without adequate compensation. Political leak insurance is available to offer a solution to this issue. Changes in legislation can also adversely affect the revenue of a project, such as the increase of corporate tax, reducing net revenue 
of private sponsor or increased import taxes. Often a change in law provision can be included in the concession contract to project the private partner against the impact of future changes to legislation. There are also regulatory risks. Let's take the example of a private operator providing water services in exchange for the right to collect fees from users. If the relevant regulatory authority is not fully politically independent, it may be tempted to reward tariffs in order to please the public, correspondingly reducing private operator revenues and putting the financial viability of the entire project at risk. To mitigate these risks, the private operator will seek guarantees regarding the setting of tariffs, perhaps by including a tariff revision formula directly to the contract, and would attempt to secure recourse against adverse action by the regulator. The last category of risks we would like to introduce to you involving risks stemming from the force majeure events. Force majeure concerns circumstances beyond the control of contracting parties that can make it impossible for an affected party to fulfill its obligations. Such circumstances can be the consequence of natural disaster, civil wars, and so on. The quick question in this regard are whether a private partner should receive compensation for such adverse events in order to prevent default and whether a contract should be terminated if such events of considerable magnitude or duration. For example, a contract should be terminated if an event lasts longer than six months and compensation could be paid depending on contractual arrangements, either to the lender alone or to both lender and equity providers. Compensation mechanisms, however, are no substitute for insurance against force majeure risks. This concludes our review of the main type of PPP project risks. We hope we have highlighted the importance of risk allocation as a critical factor in PPP project structuring and contract negotiation. A risk metric is often used in contract drafting and the negotiation of project structure to facilitate discussion and outline all risks and their corresponding allocation. This key document should be created early in the project development process, and it can greatly impact the attractiveness of a project. Risk allocation will also influence profit margins sought by private investors. That concludes the fourth module of SCAP e-learning series on public-private partnerships. Thank you for watching and for your interest in SCAP work. Please check our SCAP website for more info and additional resources on PPPs at worldwideweb.unscap.org.